We are joined by our spectator regular columnist, Michael De Percy, who is also a senior lecturer in political science. Michael, welcome to the show. It's great to be back, Alexandra. It's always a pleasure to have you here. And look, I thought you and I might have a little bit of fun at the expense of electric vehicles. A full disclosure to our audience, I am not a hater of electric vehicles as a concept. As proof, I am not going to, I'm not simply jumping on a bandwagon here. Here is a photograph of me more than a decade ago sitting behind the wheel of a Tesla. It's highly embarrassing, but there you go. There's another photo I won't share of me sitting in the front boot of the Tesla, but there you go. That was way back when Tesla was fighting for the right to put its car in a standard showroom and the US states were scrambling to create legislation to make it illegal for Tesla to sell their cars online. Now Tesla was cutting out the middlemen in the car industry and sidestepping the process of haggling over price and traditional dealerships didn't like that at all. Now before we get into it, what are your general thoughts on EVs? Do you hate them Michael or are you kind of, eh, don't mind? Honestly, I'm ambivalent about them. I think where they're fit for purpose, they can be great. Look, if I was commuting, doing short trips, living in Canberra, for example, uh, it'd be a great place to have an EV, especially with the fuel prices as they are at the moment. The simple fact is for me, living out in regional New South Wales, regularly travelling 500, 600, 1,000 kilometres a day, it's just impractical, uh, completely impractical. I also need the ability to go off-road and through water. And if you've seen the state of the roads in the local councils in regional New South Wales, you know what I'm talking about. But look, yeah, look, I'm very ambivalent about the technology itself. Uh, the issue for me is the way that it's been adopted as part of a woke trope where, you know, driving an EV makes you somehow more virtuous than everybody else. Yeah, it's kind of bizarre. And I, I agree with you. I also live in a remote area and we've got a dirt road and it floods. I guarantee you that it will be the first car being carted away after the flood, dead to the world forever. So it's not great for everyone. But Michael, that kind of free market competition that we saw in the early years of EV production was good for the car market. Not only did it cause traditional cars to step up their game, Tesla was also forced to rapidly develop its technology to justify the high prices. Now, that healthy ecosystem ended when governments around the world became infatuated with net zero and started legislating electric vehicles. Now, technology stagnated. The market was flooded with inferior products and it is about to happen again with China dumping hundreds of thousands of substandard EVs into Europe. Now, we hear over and over and over again that electric vehicles are green, that they are net zero, and that they are virtuous, as you said, you know, enough for a teal to drive one even. Now, you made an article uh, this week saying that 7% of the EV data is made up. Michael, what's going on with EV virtue? Well, the first thing is obviously 70% is a satirical figure. Uh, but, but my point is that um, th these virtue signalers often say to me, well, I'm an academic and I should know better than to downplay EVs or to even question their morality. And this, this for me, is the beginning of the end for, uh, for, for the woke sort of element to electric vehicles. I mean, if they're that good, they should speak for themselves. And, and then the trouble is too, though, that when we look into the data, what was really interesting for me was the Environmental Protection Agency in the United States has politicised EVs by saying, here's all the myths about EVs, and we've busted them. But we've busted them using illustrative figures only without actual evidence. And, and look, they cherry-picked the data, uh, and I find it very problematic. I mean, you, you could argue from the data that an EV uh, produces six times more carbon emissions than a standard uh, internal combustion engine. But again, that would be cherry picking the data because it's simply not true in different jurisdictions under different circumstances. So those nuances are just completely ignored where they're talking up EVs and how great they are. And it's really interesting. I've even had uh, people in the industry lobby side of EVs uh, contact me after having written some pieces for the mainstream media where they've said, oh, you should have spoken to us before writing your article because you've got it so wrong. And I'm, I'm thinking, well, how can you tell? And the simple fact is, if you look at all the data, it's so varied, it's based on models, it's not based on complete evidence where it's been tested, uh, it can be cherry-picked. It, it, it's a real shambles, to be honest. Well, the one thing I noticed, Michael, is that no one is forced to justify with cold, hard numbers what they mean by green. They say an electric vehicle is green, but it doesn't come with a birth-to-death explanation. Now, one point in your article revolves around batteries. Is this enormous, you know, heavy lithium heart of the EV really that green? Well, one of the big problems is that it creates a different type of mining. So we're looking at you know, things like co cobalt, lithium and, and other 
uh, rare earth minerals. Um, one of the big problems for me is how long is this going to last? You know, are we going to be able to recycle these? There is talk about uh, Red Bank in the US and other organisations that uh, are working toward these above ground mines where they effectively mine the minerals back out of the used batteries and so on, but they still have to be able to turn a profit and there's some debate over whether or not they will at this stage. And we, we have similar issues around wind turbines, solar panels, whether they're recyclable, how we can recover the, you know, these rare earth elements and so on. So the, the, really the, the big problem is that it is shifting, uh, it's basically shifting these emissions to other areas or other industries as, as opposed to the emissions of the vehicles themselves. And to me, that's the big problem because now all of a sudden we're hiding one element of those emissions and we can't get accurate statistics that prove or disprove these arguments. Well, not only that, recycling is never factored into the carbon emission life cycle of these things. And wind turbine blades are the perfect example. If you want to recycle those, you have to throw them in a blast furnace, a blast furnace powered by coal that emits lots and lots of carbon emissions. And uh, this is a country, let's not forget, Australia, it cannot recycle plastic bags and plastic bottles to a high enough quality to resell them on the market. So they sit in warehouses or get shipped to Asia to, Asia to be burned. And we're saying we're going to recycle these very complicated batteries and solar panels. It's, it's not going to happen in our lifetimes and it's certainly not going to happen for net zero to 2030. Now, something that we often see used is the case against fossil fuels are uh, images of these open cut coal mines. Now, setting aside the reality that the renewable energy industry has caused a massive uptick in coal because you need coal to make steel, plenty of elements used in things like electric vehicles require open-cut mines and really, really dirty ones at that. Your article mentions cobalt mining in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, but there are also some shocking mines elsewhere that never make it to the Green MP's election campaign. These are images up on the screen now of nickel mines in Indonesia. Now, nickel is one crucial element used in electric vehicles. In Russia, nickel mining is responsible for some of the country's worst air pollution. Lithium mines contain some of the worst pollution in the world. South America is famous for its yellow, green, turquoise and pink pools of lithium carbonate. And not only does lithium consume water, 2.2 million tonnes for one tonne of lithium, it also contaminates water in the poorest nations in the world. Michael, this story is the same for every rare element on the list of an EV. How is it that we come to marketing, a marketing campaign that these technologies are saving the world when they're clearly nowhere near as green as they claim to, claim to be? It's really interesting in that the, um, the mining effort that goes into this is not captured in that picture. It's not captured in that image. But there's also an element of, particularly when it comes to renewables and indeed EVs, is that destroying the environment to save the environment is kind of okay. It's okay to kill koalas, for example, you know, if, if it's going to be a wind turbine, not if it's going to be a, a coal mine or something else. And so really it is displacing these externalities in a way that the consumer, and, and as I've argued in my article, if you look at the actual st statistics that are available, the models that are available, you can't get a clear picture of what the reality of uh, EVs impact on the environment is. And so to just sort of hide this displacement of mining, to say mining's bad unless it's for EV materials, it, it just doesn't make any sense. And it's, it's definitely part of this trope as opposed to uh, some, an enlightenment thinking approach where we look at the actual facts. I mean, because if we think about it, l let's just say that we really want to achieve net zero. Well, there are so many different ways to do this, but government has chosen one particular approach and we're sticking with that. And then when you sort of put forward the argument and say, well, you know, it's not as green as you think it is, they say, oh, yes, but the, the technology will improve in the future. Well, all technologies will improve in the future, so why aren't they all on the table? And this, to me, is the big problem. They've made a virtue out of a, uh, effectively one type of technology and there's no evidence to support the virtuousness of this. Well, I promised you a little bit of fun. In this week's magazine, Do The Sloan shares some war stories about the electric vehicles and those who have tried to embrace technology to save the planet. 11 years ago, yes, 11, Top Gear released this review of electric vehicles. Have a watch. By the time we reached the city centre, my range was down to seven miles. So I looked on the sat-nav for the nearest official charging point. 40... <laughs> the nearest charging place it gives me is... 45 miles away. I can only go <laughs> seven. That's a very useful function you've got there. OK, Covent Garden car park, 77 miles away. 
What possible use is that? We've just got to stop somewhere and beg for the use of a socket. No, that's it. No, that's it. That's it. Oh, not there. This is the future of motoring here. This is all of your lives here. This is what's going to become of you all. <laughs> Michael, judging from the horror stories in Judas, Judas piece this week in the magazine, it doesn't look like we have evolved much from that clip. That's really true. And there was an experiment done recently driving from Melbourne to Sydney, two identical BMWs, one the electric version, one the uh, internal combustion engine version. The uh, electric vehicle was some two or more hours slower than the, the standard vehicle. Uh, and it was also actually more expensive. It was cheaper to use petrol than it was to use the electricity charging on the way. Now, again, people will say that this will involve, you know, improve in the future. You just showed a video from 11 years ago. It hasn't improved in 11 years very much. And, you know, again, if we were serious about this, we would say, well, let's have things that are fit for purpose. You know, we could have an inner city limit where only electric vehicles could drive, as an example. You know, and, and again, why does it have to be that way? We could say that, you know, um, another example is electric buses. Um, so electric buses are a great way to reduce pollution. Um, but New South Wales government's mandated them from the entire state. So there are school buses out in the regions. The contractors are just going to fold up in 2030 and then the New South Wales government is going to have to provide all of these electric buses themselves. Not, I mean, not this is that, ridiculous. Not just that, Michael, but those electric buses in the UK keep catching fire and filling the streets with black smoke. So they're not doing brilliantly. Look, last question here. We've only got three or so minutes. But previously, we lived in a world where technology had to compete with itself and the consumer would decide which products are the best value and the best performers. Now, this usually incurred some kind of trade-off between price and efficiency. And indeed, efficiency is exactly what this evolutionary environment would select for, which is great for everyone. Now we have the government telling us that we need to be selecting products based upon their perceived green virtue. Cost is being masked by public money and inefficiency and corruption are running absolutely rife through the market. Now, it's not only EVs, our entire energy sector is being, you know, put into this terrible environment. Where does this leave us, Michael? Are we going to see our technology into a green utopia or will this stifle technology and, you know, make it less productive and less efficient? I think what we'll find is there'll be elements of technology that are not being developed simply because there's no market incentive. Um, there's different ways of looking at technology. We either develop to help ourselves or it gets developed and we adapt our lives to it. But there's also this idea of technological momentum where we both shape and are shaped by the technology. The unfortunate thing is when government steps in and tries to control things, they never pick winners. They always pick something that's not as good and we end up going down a particular path that uh, is not necessarily good for everybody. And you can see that the biggest problem with our whole energy transition, this is all about social control. There's a major element of social control. It's not necessarily about the technology. And if we talk about lobby groups, we've just swapped one group for another in this whole industry. So, look, there's some major problems here and I'm really hoping that the facts will come out in future where we can make informed choices. Yes, yeah, so it reminds me of what we've got the lobbyists in there for the uh, social media infrastructure whispering in the ears of ministers who have no experience of social media and their entire idea of the online world begins and ends at their local newspaper and that's it. And they're making decisions that will change the entire fabric of the internet for everyone. But that's a discussion for another time. Thank you so much for joining us here today on Spectator TV, Michael. Great to be back. Thanks for having me.